Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on the heart. In this video, what we're going to talk about is pathological uh, cardiac hypertrophy. So, pathological cardiac hypertrophy. Okay, so we're going to start off uh, with uh, the story of how pathological cardiac hypertrophy occurs. We're then going to talk about what the actual symptoms of it are, i.e. Uh, what actually happens to the cells, how their contractility, the force with which they generate when they contract, how that goes down, and how their response to um, beta-1 agonists uh, also goes down, basically. Okay, right. So, uh, pathological cardiac hypertrophy, then. So, it's also known as maladaptive cardiac hypertrophy. Either word um, is, can be used. Right, so what happens in uh, pathological cardiac hypertrophy? So it starts with the heart struggling. So let's, let's draw a picture of the heart so that we can have something to point at at least. Okay, so here is our right ventricle with the pulmonary trunk coming off there. And then over here, this is the left atrium with the left ventricle here, like so, and with the aorta coming off here. Right, okay, so let's just label these up. So this is the right atrium, RA. This is the right ventricle, RV. This is the left ventricle, LV. And this is the left atrium over here. Right, so the heart struggles, and we'll talk, for the basis of this, we'll talk about the left ventricle always, but the same principles carry over to uh, certainly the right ventricle, and also into the atria as well. Okay, so, what happens? It starts with the heart struggling. Now, why might the left ventricle struggle to perform its role? Well, what is its role? Its role is to push the blood into uh, the aorta, okay? Now, why might it have a really difficult time pushing the blood into the aorta? Well, if it's receiving a huge amount of resistance to the movement of blood into the aorta, that might be a reason. Now, why would it receive um, a huge amount of resistance uh, from the aorta? Well, basically, if the aortic blood pressure where it was really, really high, or just too high, full stop, then that would mean that the heart would have a much more difficult time pushing blood out into uh, the aorta if the aortic blood pressure was too high. And this is why having high blood pressure, hypertension, okay, so let me put this here, hypertension is a risk factor for um, pathological cardiac hypertrophy, which can then lead on to congestive heart failure. So that's why we're so worried about hypertension nowadays in the modern world, because it does damage to the heart, and other things as well, but uh, the heart in particular. Okay, so that's one reason why the heart might struggle really, and find it really difficult to push, eject this volume of blood out into the aorta. Another reason it might find it really difficult is if you've had a heart attack. So if you've had a heart attack, then what's happened is transiently, or maybe not so transiently, but blood has not been supplied to a portion of the heart, basically. And when this happens, that portion of the heart doesn't get any oxygen or glucose, and it basically becomes hypoxic and dies. And the heart doesn't have cells which divide, basically. Uh, there are slight... There, are, there is a little bit of proliferation in the heart after birth, but so little that you can really take as a general rule that there is absolutely no cell division in the heart. That it's not quite true, but as a general rule, cells in the heart do not divide. Okay, so if you're a great big lump of your heart cells die, then you're not going to be able to replace them, basically. The heart doesn't have the capacity to regenerate cells. Okay, so if you've had a heart attack or a myocardial infarction is the fancy name for a heart attack. So infarction just means dying because of lack of oxygen. So myocardial refers to the heart, so it just means pertaining to the muscle of the heart. And infarction...
means dying due to lack of oxygen. Okay, so if you've had a myocardial infarction, then a large amount of potentially the left ventricular wall will be dead. So that's not contracting. So all the rest of the cells in the ventricle are then going to have a much more difficult time because you've got, a, let's say, a huge great portion here that's infarcted. So that bit's not contributing anymore to ejecting the blood. So this could mean that the rest of the left ventricular wall cells struggle to eject the blood from the left ventricle into the aorta. So both of these uh, scenarios could mean that the left ventricular myocardium is struggling to eject blood into the aorta. Okay, and when uh, it struggles to eject the blood into the aorta, what's going to happen? Well, that means that it's going to eject less blood into the aorta. So the stroke volume is going to go down. The stroke volume is how much blood the heart pushes into the aorta every time it beats. Okay, now if it's struggling to eject it, then stroke volume will go uh, down. And more importantly, if the blood isn't ejected, then it's going to remain in the left ventricle after the left ventricle is contracted. So what will happen is something known as the end systolic volume will go up. So the end systolic volume means how much blood is left in the left ventricle after it's contracted. So the end systolic volume will go up and then what's gradually going to happen it's because the left atrium won't know that the end systolic volume's gone up. So it will push in the same amount of blood again. And therefore, you're adding more blood into the heart, but the end systolic volume has gone up. So now what that's going to mean is that when you add the amount of blood that was already in the left ventricle to the amount that you've added in now, the new amount that you've got is going to gradually accumulate and accumulate because you're gradually pumping less and less into the aorta. So, this is also going to lead to the end diastolic volume going up. So the end diastolic volume is the amount of blood in the left ventricle just before it contracts, okay? So the end systolic volume is the amount you've got left over after it's contract did the end diastolic volume was the amount that you had in before it's contracted. So gradually what's going to happen is this uh, left ventricle is just going to fill up with blood. It's going to be like a balloon and you're filling, putting more and more water in. So the left ventricle is going to feel a lot of strain or stress on um, its walls. Okay, and this stress on the walls of the um, ventricle stress goes up, this is going to cause the pathological remodeling. This is going to cause pathological cardiac hypertrophy. Okay, so what's going to follow is that you're going to get pathological cardiac hypertrophy. Now, what happens in pathological cardiac hypertrophy? Well, I've told you that there is no um, proliferation of cells within the heart uh, after birth, pretty much. So, if we want uh, to grow the heart. If we want the heart to grow, okay, what instead you have to do is hypertroph the cells. So basically what happens is all the cells in the wall of the left ventricle, so let me show you a cell in the wall of the left ventricle, they're going to get bigger basically in the hope that we're going to be able to strengthen up the wall and therefore cope with uh, this um, cope with ejecting the blood into the aorta, basically. So the heart is trying to solve this problem, but in fact it ends up making it worse. So, what it tries to do is it tries to uh, increase the thickness of the wall, and it does this by taking the uh, cardiomyocytes. So this is our cardiomyocyte before, and what it's going to do is it's going to make it bigger. And when you make a cell bigger, that's known as hypertrophy. So this is a hypertrophed um, cardiomyocyte. And you can see that its length has got a little bit bigger, but the main thing that I've shown getting bigger here is how thick it is. Okay, and this is the um, feature of pathological cardiac hypertrophy over physiological cardiac hypertrophy.
in physiological cardiac hypertrophy, also known as adaptive cardiac hypertrophy, which is the kind of hypertrophy you get if you are um, a world-class athlete or if you're pregnant, okay? Uh, what happens is the cell becomes much longer but only increases its width by a tiny amount. In pathological cardiac hypertrophy, the change in width of the cardiomyocyte is much greater than the change in length. So delta just means the change in length. So this, all this says is how much the width gets bigger is greater than how much the length gets bigger. Right, so what happens in the wall of your left ventricle is that your cardiomyocytes go from looking like this to looking like this. So they all get thicker. And what this is going to do is it's going to massively thicken up the wall of this left ventricle, okay? But the heart itself doesn't actually get any bigger. So if you're looking at the heart from the outside, it will still look exactly the same. What's happened, though, is the walls have got thicker and they've sort of, in well, impeded in on the lumen of the chamber in here, basically. Okay, so that's because the cells have got thicker and thicker and thicker in, and the walls, therefore, impeded inwards. Right. Now, I say that the heart does this uh, to try and solve this problem of um, ejecting the blood out in, uh, into the aorta when it's struggling with doing that, and how this doesn't really help. Well, that's a little bit of a lie. It does help. Initially, it does help. So the heart does this modification, and initially it solves the problem. Initially, it means that the uh, ventricular wall can now beat more powerfully, and it solves the problem. However, it stops solving the problem. It lasts for a while, and then it just decays, and it gets worse than it was even initially. So these hypertrophed cells like this basically have... Uh, eventually, what will happen is they will get less good uh, features as far as a cardiomyocyte is concerned. So the force they are capable of generating will actually end up being lower than the force that a normal cardiomyocyte is um, capable of producing. And also, uh, their responses to beta-1 agonists will decrease. But initially, it's important to understand initially it does help. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.